And Barbara, we're live. Good morning, everyone. I'm Barbara Wallace Grossman, professor of theater at Tufts University, and I'll be moderating today's artist conversation about a searing new play by Andrei Koryechik called Insulted Belarusia, translated by John Friedman. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists, playwright Andrei Koryechik, who is zooming in from temporary exile, translator John Friedman, coming in from Greece, director Guillermo Cienfuegos, co-artistic director of Rogue Machine Theater in Los Angeles, coming in from Los Angeles, director Igor Goliak, artistic director of Arlequin Players Theater in Boston, coming in from Boston, and I'm also in Boston, speaking to you on land that once belonged to the Massachusetts people, a tribe whose name is now our states. Before we start the conversation, I'd like to, particularly for those of you who may not have had the opportunity to see one of the readings, just give you some context for this play. Insulted Belarusia is about a revolution that has happened in Belarus, not a revolution that happened 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 10 years ago or a year, it's happening now. People are on the streets of Belarus now protesting a profoundly undemocratic election process, an election that should have resulted in the removal from office of the man who has held it for the past 26 years, President Alexander Lukashenko, who's been called the last dictator in Europe. There was a democratic election in Belarus on, in August. And on August 9th, 2020, 2020, just this past August, Lukashenko refused to accept the election results, declared himself the winner of a landslide victory over his opponent Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. And instead of having her as president-elect, we have in fact a contested election whose results have been called fraudulent and not free and not fair. Belarusians took to the streets in protest, demonstrating their support for Tikhonovskaya. Lukashenko unleashed brutal, brutal police and security forces to stop and silence them. Andrei Koryechik, in addition to being a gifted artist, is a member of the opposition mo movement. And as an artist, he turned to his art, to playwriting, to the power of language, to capture this tumultuous moment as it is unfolding now. I just went online last night and there was a protest march on Sunday, a protest march on Monday. It's happening now. And so he's putting into words the stories that he's seen and heard, stories people have told him about being beaten, captured, and jailed. He started writing a play on August 21st and finished it three weeks later in early September, just one month after the contested election. And then he fled the country because he knew his life was in danger. He immediately sent the play to John Friedman, asking him to translate it and to organize some readings to spread the word about the events in Belarus. Within 10 minutes, John has said, he had lined up 10 theaters, six theaters who were willing to do it. Six days later, he finished the translation and sent it to dozens more theaters. As of early November, at least 66 companies in 22 countries are participating in the Insulted Belarusia Worldwide Reading Project. The play is currently translated, being translated into 17 languages with more undoubtedly to come and publications of the work beginning to happen. The violence continues. Lukash Lukashenko is still in power. Tikhonovskaya is still in exile as is Andre and thousands of protesters continue to be arrested, beaten, and jailed. At least four has, have died. I, I'm sure the number is higher. So with that as context, I'd like to move to our artist conversation. And I'd like to begin, if I may, and it's okay if I call you Andre? Andre? Yes. Okay, no. thank you, Andre. I'd like to direct this first question to Andre. Why did you feel that you had to write this play? Why theater as a medium? And how did you decide to use only seven characters, none of whom have actual names? 
well, uh, I, I am in playwriting for 20 years, and I had uh, my first uh, theater premiere in Moscow Art Theater, uh, theater which was founded by Stanislavski and Nimirovich Danchenko in Moscow uh, when I was 20 years old. Uh, but most of my plays were quite entertaining and uh, uh, I made a lot of entertaining movies, uh, like a screenwriter, but this year changed everything. Uh, on the 9th of uh, August, I think every Belarusian uh, person made his personal choice uh, or to be on the uh, side of uh, uh, Mr. Lukashenko, who steal this election, uh, uh, who tries to stay in power after 26 years of very strict dictatorship, or to try to change somehow a uh, beautiful country, actually, uh, with fantastic people, uh, which was captured by, by, by this man. And of course, I was on the side of, uh, like many artists, uh, many actors, many poets, many writers on the, on the side of people who went to the streets to stop this. And after three weeks, I understood that I should tell something as a writer. Uh, it was not easy uh, choice. In that time already was criminal case against uh, uh, coordination council. Uh, and I'm member of uh, with Svetlana Alexievich, Nobel Prize winner in literature. Uh, I was in village uh, hiding and I started to write this play. Uh, I choose the personalities, uh, we, we talk about uh, characters, I choose uh, um, uh, characters which I think is uh, the most important in this revolution. People who uh, influenced uh, to, to the situation uh, in the most uh, like bigger way. Of course, it's President Lukashenko. Of course, it's Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. We know, uh, now the world knows their names. But as well, there are some people who are not so well known abroad, but very well known inside Belarus because of some events. Uh, for example, uh, everybody knows that Lukashenko wants to give his power to his son, Nikolai, uh, and Nikolai became the member of uh, uh, character of this play. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, the lady who falsificated uh, elections and she was uh, in charge of uh, commission, electoral commission, and uh, uh, she she was the uh, manager, uh, general manager of uh, uh, gymnasium of high school, uh, and she was captured by and uh, taped, uh, videotaped and audio taped. She became very famous uh, in Belarus, and she became the character of the play. Of course, the uh, policeman who. Uh, now all the powers of Lukashenko based on the police, on the uh, special forces of police, not all police, but special forces of police, we call them on. Of course, he became a character. And uh, 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 the lady who uh, give her heart in this revolution, who give her uh, optimism, energy, and hope to this revolution, uh, Maria Kalesnikova, of course, became the prototype of one of the heroes. And as well, we have a guy who died in first, uh, or not first, but second day of a revolution on the 10th of August, Alexander Trykovsky. Um, and he, he was uh, uh, killed by two bullets uh, from police uh, uh, guns uh, in his stomach. Um, and uh, all the world saw this, uh, um, this terrible uh, um, news. Uh, uh, he, he as well, I, I think, uh, the guys like him, uh, of course, very important in this revolution. So it, it, it is persons who are important. And I wanted different uh, points of view. Some of them pro Lukashenko, some of them against Lukashenko. Everybody gives his uh, um, ideas why, why he is supporting or against. And uh, people can choose. Uh, but what I wanted, I wanted to show emotional uh, situation in the country, why this revolution became possible. That's how it worked. Thank you so much, Andre. 
I'd like to stop there and turn it over to John Friedman. John, as its translator, you have really been the vessel of transmission of Andre's powerful words to the world. And I wanna ask you, why do you think this play has gone viral so quickly? Why has it captured the world's imagination? What makes it so wrenching? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, I've, I believe there's uh, three reasons. Uh, one is the quality of the play. It's an extraordinary play. Uh, Andre did a, an amazing job writing a play in the moment, in the minute. It's a very hard thing to do to create a work of art, a lasting work of art about uh, a world that is caving in around you as you work. And it, he was able to do that. He created a, a beautiful, poetic and terrible uh, and terrifying play uh, that is going to last. It's going to speak to many generations and it's going to speak to many nations as it already is. That's, that's gonna last. Um, the other, an, another thing is that is the revolution itself. Uh, let's be honest, uh, the world is easily transfixed by politics. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, a case where we have an incredibly beautiful revolution. It's physically beautiful. You turn it on and you turn on the clips, you turn on the TV and you watch these things with these, these women coming out in white dresses with their white, red, white uh, banners and their scarves and their dresses decorated and the flags painted on their cheeks and red, white, uh, um, uh, red uh, bouquets that they give to the uh, stormtroopers. And it's, it's, it's incredibly beautiful to see. And it's incredibly terrifying to see because, uh, uh, Andre, correct me, but I believe there are now are at least 11 people have been killed. Yes. Uh, and I think it's at least 11 are dead. And we're talking about hundreds and thousands of people tortured, uh, people who have suffered lasting damage uh, that they will never get over. Um, it, it, it has been a brutal, violent revolution. And so this combination of something that's incredibly beautiful to watch. It's, it's, it's marvelous for, this is terrible to say on one hand, but it's, it's fortunate on another because it has transfixed people. On Facebook and on Twitter, you know, you turn on and you see these beautiful pictures, you know, people share them, they like them, they, it's, it's, it captures their imagination. And then all of a sudden you realize, you know, you're not talking about some beautiful little thing with, with people going around hugging uh, other people. At least you're not, not all you're talking about. You're also talking about real blood, real death, uh, real danger, and, and real pain. Um, so, uh, you know, that and uh, basically the, the, the first uh, comment I made about the, the Andres writing a play in real time and then writing a lasting play, that would actually be the, my, my third thing, that this, this is, it, the play has been written so well it is going to last. It's going to be there forever. It's, it's, it will be a national treasure in Belarus, guaranteed 100%. And I just want to add, I'll, I'll wrap this up, uh, but, but I, before I wrap it up, I want to say that I have had, we have had uh, readings in Hong Kong in English, Mandarin, Cantonese, everybody taking part in Hong, the Hong Kong readings have written, oh my God, this is about us. We have a, a theater in Nigeria who has written this, oh my Lord, this play is about us. When I first started reaching out to Americans, Americans were saying, oh my God, Trump, uh, and you know, hanging on to power, this is about us. Andre captured something, he, he captured the zeitgeist. We have this problem of dictators in the world right now. They're all over the place and they're all hanging on to power. And he captured something through the Belarusian story, which uh, has, has really captured the imagination of people all over. I think that's beautifully put. And I think we all, particularly those of us in America, understand the fragility of any political system, any democracy, and to see people who are trying to claim the democratic rights that they deserve just being brutalized. It's, it's, it's horrifying and galvanizing. I'd like to turn to Guillermo and ask you, Guillermo, I know Rogue Machine Theater is a company that specializes in world premieres, but you directed the English language premiere of this play. 
And what, what drew you to it? Why did you feel that this was something that your theater had to do and had to do first and had to do now? Uh, thank you. Well, I, I mean, frankly, it didn't feel like uh, a decision. You know, John reached out to Rogue Machine because John's uh, niece is associated with the theater and uh, she, she played uh, cheerful in our production of it. And uh, when she brought it to the company and uh, described that there was this playwright in hiding, writing this play about this revolution that I frankly knew nothing about, had heard nothing about, because I'm an American and like most Americans, I only care about what I'm interested in, you know? But uh, uh, when this came about, uh, it seems like there was no choice. You know, you mentioned early when you were speaking, Barbara, the idea of of theater uh, that tells stor historical stories that are, you know, sometimes a hundred years ago or 50 years ago, and that this is a play about uh, a, an event that is currently taking place. Can theater. I, sorry, we just lost you for a few seconds. Am I back now? You're back now. I was just saying that the, the uh, theater is not a medium where you can usually react to current events in any kind of timely fashion, you know. It, it, so this was something that was literally happening in this moment. And I felt like, uh, I felt for myself when I was asked to direct it that, uh, and I looked into what was happening in Belarus and I thought there's, there, this is an opportunity to be of service in some small way. There was a group of committed people who are really risking their lives and risking uh, see they're putting their real convictions uh, uh, they're putting up their conviction you know their money where their mouth is and uh, I can't uh, help them in that way I can't help to uh, you know uh, affect the revolution directly but I can do this I can gather a, a team of, of like-minded artists and and tell this story to whomever is listening. And, you know, we're in this time now where because of COVID, uh, we can't have theater the way we're, we're accustomed to having it. And it's frustrating. And we've turned to Zoom and Zoom is really annoying to most of us. But in this situation, it's like a godsend that in a way, uh, the fact that, the, that, that COVID was happening gave extra wings to the readings of this play because it allowed them to happen simultaneously around the globe. And, and I could watch a reading in, in Hong Kong. I could, you know, uh, uh, people could watch the, the Los Angeles reading. We could, I, I, my cat, in my cast, for instance, uh, three, two of the, one of the actors was in New York, one was in DC, one was in Cleveland and one, and the rest were in Los Angeles. And the stage manager was in a, in a motel room in Amarillo, Texas, you know? So, that wouldn't have been able to happen. And if we had done a reading, we would have done a reading for the people who we could gather in a theater. So in a way it's, it's, it seemed like um, there was no choice to be made here. I, I, I felt like, um, it felt like a fellow human being and particularly a fellow theater person was in need. They were, you know, and, and asking if we could help tell this story and so there was just no question that we were going to do that and it's an honor that we got to be the the that we got to premiere the english uh, language translation and, and then we got to do it again you know two months later and just to wrap up the idea that you were suggesting about um uh parallels you know political parallels all over the world and in our country obviously we recognize these parallels when we were doing the reading two months ago uh, and we knew that there was a possibility that in our country, some of these same questions would come up. But here we are approaching the play again, a couple months later, and in the play, you know, the play hasn't changed, but there's the words suddenly jump out like, he won't concede. And uh, let's, let's count, you know, we got to count everything and let the count is rigged. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it, I, I, I can really relate to the idea that this play, whatever, whatever constraints Andre was under, he, he caught lightning in a bottle. He caught something that speaks so directly to us as humans that I'm not surprised at all that uh, people from all over the world think it's a story about, about them, because it is. It's a story about all of us. Absolutely. 
beautifully said, Guillermo. Thank you. And I mean, certainly we have documentary theater as a genre, you know, the Laramie Project about the murder of Matthew Shepard. But what you said about this is happening now, the white hot intensity with which you've written it, Andre, the sense of urgency that just leaps off the page and grabs you by the heart. I mean, it, it really, it, it, it's gut wrenching. So I wanna actually turn to Igor because Igor, I know Arlequin has mounted stage readings in English, but you've actually directed the first production in Russian. And I wanna ask you about the experience of doing that. And if you see a difference in the response of Russian speaking audience members, as opposed to English speaking audience members, or is, well, I'll just stop there. Do you notice a difference in what's been your experience working with the play in Russian as well as in English? Yeah, I think, thank you very much uh, for, for um, the question. I think it's really interesting uh, that um, part, a part of our audience is a Russian speaking, uh, probably bigger part, probably around 60%. And we do productions in both Russian and English. And it's so interesting that the response has been so, so, uh, so di different um, because the uh, Russian speaking audience that we, uh, uh, that we have, you know, came from the uh, Soviet Union and it really hits close to home it, 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 it you know it's a two-sided coin on one side on one side it's people that are ready to mm, are ready to understand and, 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 and try to kind of live in the moment and the other side of the coin is people that don't want to hear anything about what's happening over there they they, they want to close off and never even hear about the existence of whatever they left because they were so hurt by, uh, by whatever they, they emigrated from. And, you know, there's, so the two sides of the coin, one is very aggressive anti-Soviet. Uh, it's really a, a kind of like a Soviet reg regime. And the other side of people, I don't want to hear about it. It hurts too much. Uh, so th that has been really, uh, really interesting. The response, uh, the response of the uh, English speaking uh, audience uh, has been great, has been, oh, uh, so this is not a part of Russia. Is this, is this somewhere in Siberia? Uh, uh, almost. Um, so it, it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, further, I would say from them, um, but, uh, you know, I, I think they're also very, very open to, to learning about uh, what's happening. So, you know, experiencing this uh, through both lenses seems extremely interesting. And then when they intermix, uh, when the Russians come to the English speaking uh, production, the experience of listening to this production is quite different. And the talk back is quite interesting. It's, uh, there's a lot of kind of inner conflict, uh, especially with the immigrants and, and immigrants are feeling on one hand understood because this is what they left. This is what they ran away from. And on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, feeling seen. The other thing that I want to mention is what fascinated me about this play and why I responded so quickly is I, what I've been thinking about is the idea of where's the, where's the um, threshold to which we as human beings need to respond to what's happening on the other side of the earth. Like we can't respond to everything. Otherwise we go crazy, right? But what is a what is a person that what is a human being in the larger sense of the word? What do what do we have to respond to? And it's a question that I've been living with for for a while. And you know, it's a question that that started with uh, the uh, the historical uh, aspect of, of 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 Holocaust. You know, 
which baffles me as how how is it how is it how is it possible that country that other countries didn't respond like the United States, right? Uh, how is how is it how is it possible? And we are now. I'm not comparing, but I feel like there is a responsibility. There's a human responsibility uh, to respond and not to shy away from it. And that's what really drove me uh, to this play. Not really the artistic side. It's the, it's the human side uh, that, um, because the artistry is very limited on Zoom. Um, it's it's what, exactly what Guillermo said. It's being able to respond because of this pandemic so, so quickly and responding and, and trying to help with, with what we can. Thank you for that, Igor. I, I know this is a point where I'm supposed to ask Guillermo and Igor to show a clip, but I just given the question that you just posed, maybe I'll take this opportunity to just open it to the group for the moment and then we'll come back to the clips. What, what is, I mean, you're doing your responsibility as artists and theater people, we're doing readings, but ultimately what, what is the hope? What can we hope that these readings will lead to? What, I mean, I guess it's, what is the power of theater ultimately? What can it affect? How do you envision the outcome of this worldwide reading project on a man who's clung to power for 26 years? People are already rioting in the streets. What what else can we do? What should we do? What can theater do? And that's open to all of you. I think well, Andre should be the first to answer that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I will start because I have this question in my head every day. You know, uh, when, when I, uh, during uh, my writing uh, was uh, closed and. Uh, uh, demolished the National Theater in Minsk. Uh, Lukashenko just uh, fired the whole uh, artistic crew, uh, including uh, directors, uh, artists, everybody. Today, for example, just today, uh, this news uh, very, very hot, uh, 15 actors from New Drama Theater in Minsk were fired uh from the theater it's uh, the main uh, artistic crew uh more than 20 artists were fired from grodno state theater because of their position so uh what was it in my head i uh, understand that 26 years we were uh like in the uh stone uh you know uh cage we we had no uh, communications with the world, really communications, I mean, uh, re real communications. We, we had this uh, iron curtain, which mm -hmm. Lukashenko built it for everybody in Belarus. So uh, my idea was to show uh, actors, artists, uh, intelligent people in Belarus that they are not alone, mm -hmm. that actors all over the world will read the play about Belarus, about the struggle, about the protest. And it means that they will discuss it. They will bring this information to their theater audiences. And uh, so it means that people all over the world will think about the problems of Belarus and send the, the, uh, their, uh, I think, uh, greetings, their love, their good emotions, their support. It, it's very important, I, I think, uh, because when you struggle alone, you, you actually, uh, you, 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 you don't have the hope. If you feel that you are in the kind of network of, of artistic people in the world, it, it gives you a, a different kind of uh, strength in this situation, it gives you hope. So I think I think it's very important to show solidarity with uh, uh, artistic people uh, all over the world. It means if if, if uh, the problems like these in uh, other countries, for example, uh, I, I know about like suppression in China or in in, in some other totalitarian countries 
we already should somehow support them, even if we are 10,000 kilometers from China, because actually the art is absolutely uh, borderless. Theater is, uh, don't have borders. And it's so important. That's what was in my head. I love the way you put that. I mean, we talk about doctors without borders, but the idea that art is art is borderless, theater is borderless, and that it's a source of hope. I think that's really profound. Um, do any does anybody else want to add to that, or should we go to the clips now? Would that be? I would just I would like to want to add just to underline what Andre said is that uh, in these you know authoritarians depend on doing what they do. Uh, in secret, they control. They try to control the images and control. The first thing they do is take control of media, and in this case, the theaters. And uh, in our way, we're doing what you often hear people chant in, in uh, protests when they say the whole world is watching. You know, uh, you're, it's it's a lot harder to get away with things when everybody's got their eyes on you. So this is just an attempt that hopefully more and more eyes will be on what's happening there. Absolutely. And I know, Igor, you had actually one of the Belarusian actors join you as a cast member in one of the readings live from Minsk. Could you just tell us about that? Yeah, it was an idea that uh, the, the idea that this, uh, what everyone is talking about, that this is happening now and this is real. This is as real as it gets. And almost when we performed this play, there was a sense, can we perform it? Like is the is a performative structure of something that's being uh, uncovered right now and, and, and with real people dying, uh, can we pretend to be them? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult question for me. So in thinking about that question, I, uh, I asked Andre to help me find a uh, an actor in Minsk uh, that would perform uh, the role of the corpse, mm. and Andre suggested Alice uh, Malchanov, uh, and he he was unbelievable. We met a couple of times with him, and I asked him. And uh, uh, when we perform it, it's eight o'clock here. It's three o'clock. I think three three a.m. Yeah. Uh, uh, in Minsk, and uh, I asked him. You know, can you walk outside? Can you say these lines and walk on the streets of Minsk? And he said, no, I can't. It, I, it's th at 3 a.m., at 3.30 a.m. Uh, doing this, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult. Yeah. I said, can, can you go? I said, fine. What about your balcony? Can you go to your balcony? Uh, and uh, and, and uh, he said, yes. Uh, and he went to, to his balcony. And as soon as he gets to this balcony, it's a, it's a balcony with windows, actually, windowed balcony. And I see the white, red, white flag hanging on the balcony. So there's no better set design. <laughs> it's it's pre-designed. <laughs> and and he and, and and I said, Did you just hang this? No, no, it's been hanging here for, for all this time. Do, is it dangerous to hang? Maybe, I don't know, but it's here. What play? What play? Are, there's no play. And and then when when he when he uh, at one point he says his lines. And he opens the window, opens the window to the balcony, and says, "This city is mine. And I will not give it away." And we see Minsk, mm. the lights of Minsk. We see this flag that was there, that was not pre-made, that was not pre, you know, for for theater site specific. Incredibly powerful. And just for people who, again, may not know the play, when Igor refer refers to the actor playing the corpse, the characters in the play do not have names. Although two of them, well, the, they're based on real people, but the, the characters are called Oldster, Novice, Mentor, Corpse, Cheerful, Avian, and youth. And maybe that's a good time to ask you, Andre, why you opted for almost emblematic names. Made me think of the morality play, Everyman. Is this a morality play or just is there no. another reason? 
well, it, it's difficult because, uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I didn't take one person, only one person as a prototype. Some um, characters are combined uh, in their stories. Uh, uh, for example, I took uh, the real stories uh, which happened in our uh, jail, in prison Akrestina, when people were tortured and give these real stories to the mouths of uh, two personages, uh, to the cheerful and to the corpse, uh, but it's real stories. And uh, as well, I made some uh, connections between the personages during the play, uh, which uh, to, to show that Belarus is a very small country and actually, actually everybody is quite connected and you can find connection through the one person to uh, almost everybody, I mean, one or two persons. Uh, so that's, uh, and because I didn't take uh, like all, all the truths, but has some like 20 or 30% of uh, imaginary uh, 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 the situations uh, to, to connect uh, people. I decided not to give the real names uh, because it will be not fair to, to, to the people because I, I uh, put some more information that uh, than only this personage uh, has. Uh, and another uh, thing, I, I think that it's universal play as Jonathan said uh, and these kind of personages can be found in many countries in different way, by, but, but in many countries. Mm -hmm. And even in the United States, when president says, I, I don't believe in, in these results, uh, I, I have my own results, I win. Uh, that what Lukashenko said, I, I win. Even when people show him numbers uh, and uh, he said, no, I win and I will keep this power and they want to stay in power and you don't understand and you are not good people. I made such a good stuff for you, but you try to fire me, it's no, it will not work, I will stay. So it's psychological stuff, which is quite common in many, many countries and situations common for many countries. That's why, uh, as Johnson said, it worked in, in Hong Kong, in Nigeria, uh, in Romania, when they remember Ceausescu times, in Poland, when they remember uh, times of Lech Walesa and Adam Michnik and uh, the solidarity times. Uh, so, and in Russia, of course, in Russia, because they have the same situation actually in, in Russia. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that in a few years they will have the same protests as well against Putin. So everybody f feels that there is something common in, in his country with this play. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I, I didn't take names. Thank you very much. I think at this point, it would be really helpful to see the clips that you've prepared. So I'd like to begin with um, Igor, if you could just set us up for the clip from Arlequin and then Guillermo from Rogue Machine. And I understand that they both involve the same character, but seen at different points in the reading. So Igor, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we were asked uh, uh, to um, come up with a clip that uh, was really meaningful to us. And uh, when uh, uh, Guillermo shared his clip, it was exactly the same clip that I was gonna pick. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and so I decided uh, in, in, in collaboration with Guillermo, uh, I decided to pick a clip uh, from the early stages, from the early part of the uh, of the play, um, with the same character, and maybe when Guillermo shows his clip, it's we will see the journey of this character, the arc, uh, the arc of this character. Uh, the character's name's uh, name is Mentor, and she's the infamous uh, person that was heading uh, the uh, election commission uh, at a school. Uh, and she's the one that was actually recorded. You can find this audio. Uh, there may be video. I'm not sure, but there's definitely audio um, on audio. YouTube. Yeah. On on uh, audio on YouTube where she says, "Okay, these are the numbers, and this is what we're gonna have." And so this is the character that we get uh, to see uh, in uh, Andre's play, and this is this is one of her first monologues in the beginning. 
Какая тварь выложила в интернет запись нашей репетиции? А ну, смотреть с нее в глаза. Светлана Викторовна, ты? Катерина, твоих рук дело. Касатонова. Касатонова, шутки вам, что ли? Это же государственная тайна. Вас же, вас же поставили блюсти государственный интерес. Оказали доверие. Доверие. А вы? Вы только поглядите, что люди пишут. Вот прямо тут в Ютубе. Иуды, мы вас посадим, фальсификаторы. Вот 20 лет не фальсификаторы, а тут фальсификаторы. Вы нарушаете закон. Мне до пенсии 4 года осталось. Я из директорского кресла никуда не уйду. И президент правильно что не уходит. Свое место надо держать до конца, но потом и кровью заработано. Все эти бюллетени, это все баловство. Значит, записали цифры, что я давала у протокол. Повесили на дверь и пусть подавится. А он вас всех развезет. Thank you, Igor. Uh, do you want to say anything else about it, or should we go right to Guillermo to Guillermo's clip? Let's let's go to Guillermo's clip, and then we we can uh, talk about this character. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, let's see. Let's it's it's the same character, it's mentor, it's later in the story, however. Prostitutes, drug addicts, sheep, cannon fodder. You'll be on your knees yet, begging me to come back. How could they trade me for that that dumb clock, that housewife, a woman? That pathetic thing. If that's how it is, I'll die. But I still won't go. If I do go, I'll take as much and as many with me as I can. You don't want Sasha? You'll get Putin. I don't want your pension. And I don't want your job. Take back my diplomas and your stability and your flower gardens. Take it all back. Just give me my daughter, Alina. She has a weak heart. She has asthma. Give her back. And my nephew, Nikita. My sister has hypertension. She won't survive and I won't survive if she... Give them back. Give back our children. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, the 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 it's 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 I, I I feel so good to to have learned just now that uh, that we both chose the same thing. We it also included a little bit of uh, of oldster there, but the for me anyway the the thing that really struck me about that final piece is um, and struck me about the play, especially the second time. Uh, uh, by the way, that the the. The actor, the actress playing uh, mentor in that uh, uh, clip you just saw of, of in English is uh, named Caroline Clay. Uh, all the characters in this play uh, are true believers. They're like they they they're they they're true believers in whatever it is they're hanging on, whether it's positive or negative or, or negative. You know, whether it's cheerful, who is who believes that the power of love and good can overcome. Or 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 uh, uh, Lukashenko, who can believe that that he has the God-given right to be the leader, you know, to be the president, that that he has is entitled to it. But Mentor is the most uh, poignant one for me, almost because she starts the play as a true, truly believing that that the system will take care of her if she does what she's told, if she supports the president, she'll get her pension, she'll get her bonus. She, 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 she buys into the whole program. She buys into all of it. She believes he put a Sputnik in space. She believes he scared away the coronavirus as long as it, the system will not let her down. And then as the play goes on, her belief, like the beliefs of all, so many of the characters in the play, if not all of them, get really seriously tested, if not destroyed. And in hers, um, she's being asked to, to uh, 
still hold on to these things. And, and at the end, it, it's so poignant when she says, take it all, take my pension, take everything I believe in, just give me my child back. Um, that's what that's one of the ways that uh, the universality of the play is so strong because that's a, you know, it steps away from being some kind of political uh, polemic story. It's a, it's a, you know, it's the, it's the man in front of the tanks in, in China, or it's, you know, it's, it's a woman just crying out for her child. Um, the belief systems, you know, the, you know, the, the things they really believe get, it's easy to have a conviction uh, when it's not tested when it's not when it's not, there's no danger in holding on to it um but when you know tikhonovskaya is is asked to run for president it's easy to have that conviction that she should fight for justice until she's in a room with kgb people and you know to, to continue to hold on to it is that's where we see the courage so i'm rambling a little but just the idea i'm sure igor is is, is uh, eager to talk about it as well well, thank you for your comments. And I mean, to see the impact, the person impact of the trauma on the personal, on the family. I mean, she talks about her daughter, Alina. We never see Alina as a character. We can only imagine Alina's fate. Is she raped? Is she killed? I mean, certainly nothing good. She mentions Nikita and Nikita is actually the name of the character called Corpse, her nephew. So we know his fate. So it's, it's really, it again, it kind of reinforces what you said, Andre, about how small this country is the ties that bind people and that, that really tear people apart. I was interested to see, and the other actors, by the way, Carolyn Clay in a Rogue Machine and Arlequin, Daria Denisova, both incredibly talented performers. I was interested to see that the Arlequin reading is in black and white and the Rogue Machine in, in color. What, was there any reason why you chose one over the other, either Guillermo Igor? Yeah, uh, I just want to mention uh, something about the clip. What, what, what really uh, in interests me in this character is uh, it's an internal tragedy where she's not, be she's not beaten up, but her life's conviction is completely broken. Uh, at the end, you know, towards the end of one's life where one is living in, in one direction and fully with full belief. And I can see this in Russia and John can probably attest to this uh, with full belief in, in the current state and the current uh, government and completely being broken towards the end. And I'm thinking that I have relatives in Russia uh, that, will, that will experience this, I think. Uh, and this, this internal tragedy that happens to her is something that's Mm, that was very meaningful. And the other thing that I'm that, that I'm, I'm just wondering, and maybe this is, uh, help, friends, help me out on this. I'm trying to understand when we talk about it being universal, do we diminish the meaning of this play? This is a question that I just had in my, and we, we keep saying, yes, it's universal. And I understand that, yes, it's universal and that's a positive, but is it a negative? Like that we address this play as being universal that we say, no, it's about everything, but being about everything, it's about, it's not, we're forgetting about the issue at hand. Well, that's where, that's where the, uh, the quality of the writing comes in for me, Igor, because this play is written so well that this play works on all kinds of levels. Of course, it works on an international level. It works on a, on a universal level. But as we're talking right now about one of the most important characters in the play, and she is one of the most important because her art is the, is the longest, the deepest, and the most uh, tragic of all of the characters. I agree. Um, even including Corpse Who Dies, but, but he basically set himself up for that. So it's not as his death is not as tragic as the loss of her entire life in, in you know, uh, as you talked about, her her whole uh, the system beliefs just absolutely falls down all around her and crashes into nothing. Um, then this play has that specific, has that very specific, and it's a very specific Slavic, uh, of course, very specific Belarusian story. The people actually, if you know Belarus, which I really don't, I, I lived in Russia for 30 years, uh, I only know Belarus through by way of Russia, but uh, knowing Russia uh, very well, uh, I, I know that this is a very specific uh, picture of Belarusians. Um, but it, it works, you know, it works on so many levels. And, and 
that is the answer to your question at some point, uh, because it works 100% as a play specifically about Belarus, specifically the revolution going on right now and these people. And yet when it's extracted from that situation, all of a sudden it begins to fill up with other meanings that other people bring to it. Um, I, and I just have to add, because I forgot to mention it, I'm talking to a guy in Chile right now about doing it in Chile. And he wrote back to me a long, long letter. And he says, I haven't heard nothing about the Belarusian revolution. But he said, it sounds like the one we're going through right now. He said, he also is in exile in Mexico. And, and he said that, that, that in, in, in Chile right now, there's this, this huge revolution going on with uh, the uprising of the, the populace, the government beating them down. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's astonishing, the universe, once again, I come back to the universality of the play. It is fitting what is happening all around the world. And yet uh, you, uh, Igor, as a, as a Russian emigre, you know perfectly well that these characters that Andre has written, they are really, really specific. And you know them. You can walk out on the street somewhere in Minsk and you can see them, you know. So Absolutely. that's how the, the reason is is the quality of the play. That's the answer to your question, if I And I think I think you're right though, Igor, is the idea is that maybe it's the use of the word universal throws it off a little bit. We're really talking about it, it, it the impact is definitely universal, but maybe we're talking about the idea that the character is so relatable that we're able to empathize with them in such a personal way. And uh, uh, I think that's put to the point of what you're saying, Igor, I think is, is it's less about it being universal and bland so that it applies to everything, but that it's so personal that we relate to it. Uh, mm -hmm. We relate to it in that specific way. Thank you. Thank you, friends. And not to get overly generic, but I mean, that's really the hallmark of any great work of art, that it works in its particular specificity, but it also speaks to larger issues. It resonates with many more people who can empathize, who can understand, even if they're not living it in the moment, the way you are, Andre, and you're the, all the people in Belarus right now. Um, I had questions, but I feel that we've already covered them. The one question was, what is it about at this play that's resonating with people around the world? Did that on. I also was gonna ask you if the pandemic had an impact on the play and its transmission, but you've already addressed that. And you know how blessed we are, even though Zoom has its limitations to be able to talk from Greece, from where you are in exile, from, from I mean, it's just, it's kind of remarkable from California. so. We did that question. So in the time remaining, which is only five minutes, I'd like to ask if, if any of you have something to add to this conversation that we haven't yet said, any point that you really want to make. And then I'd like the last word to be Andres before we sign off. So. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to say something quick, which should lead into something for Andre. And that is, uh, you know, we've talked about the, the huge scope of this, of this project and it's turned out we are now nearing the 100th event uh, of this, uh, counting translations and publications and readings and films and radio uh, programs and videos uh, and all of the responses that people have come up with. We are, we are nearing the 100th event um, uh, of the project in two months. Uh, and it has people scheduled doing things at least until January, and I expect it to go on. And uh, so we, we talk about it as a project. It's as far as this incredibly wonderful, fabulous thing. In fact, I would like to see this project fall apart at some time soon, because I would like to see Alexander Lukashenko go, just as I hope Trump leaves soon. I hope Lukashenko goes soon, and I fear I fear we are in for a long, hard pull with Alexander Lukashenko. And so I am very personally, as somebody that's very involved in this project, I want to see the project. I want, I want the project to be as tenacious as Lukashenko. Uh, I think that is my goal at this moment, at, at which point, I, Andre, if you, want to, if you want to pick up on that, I'm sure you have something about that to say. Uh, first, uh... I would like to say actually thank you and express my appreciation to people who devoted their time 
uh, who uh, put their emotions, uh, who uh, made these fantastic readings all over the world. You, you, you are right. It's a lot of events, and some people uh, just come, have no knowledge about the situation, and then somehow become very active and go further, further, further. Uh, so my appreciation is, is fantastic, and especially to you, Jonathan, because actually it started from you. You are, was the first energetic point of, of this project. Uh, yes, the, the, the problem is that our revolution is very peaceful, you know. Uh, if if we took armory and go and uh, you know try to kill this bad Lukashenko, blah blah blah, maybe it, it it goes like in other like African or other countries, but it's not the way we want this revolution to happen. We don't want uh, to kill anybody, to beat anybody, to uh, crush uh, the cars or uh, shops. In, in it's very peaceful. And of course, when you are very peacefully uh, have this peaceful protest, you uh, you you have uh, other side with guns and these machines and these water pumps and everything, and they are very cruel and they put uh, people in prison and beat 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 them and uh, then send them to to uh, uh, jail for uh, like uh, half a month, months, uh, and so on. Uh, you, you never know when, when it finishes and how it finishes. I really hope this revolution will stay peaceful. I really don't want any civil war in very nice country, which I love. And uh, I, I really think it's one of the best countries in Europe, actually, uh, for me. Uh, but what, what, what I think this revolution should be a revolution of love and solidarity and our project helps us to understand that we are, uh, can change everything if we are in solidarity and help each other. That it is about, actually, uh, for me, uh, this project and this revolution and this play and our discussion and everything. It's about solidarity of good people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andre. And on that really positive and hopeful note, I'd like to say thank you to our panelists. Thank you to HowlRound. Thank you to Arlequin Players Theater, Rogue Machine Theater, Broadband Collaborative, the Cherry Orchard Festival. Thanks to all of you for making this program possible. And most of all, thank you to you, Andre, for your courage, for your creativity, and your commitment to social justice and to solidarity. So onward. Thank you so much. <laughs>